Hey guys, for those of you that don't know us, I'm Zoe. I'm a foundation dentist working here in London, and this is Ali. He's a final year dental student at University of Newcastle. Today we're going to be covering all the essential diagnoses that you should know before you start seeing patients for the first time. So we're going to be covering a lot in this video, and you could probably see that by the length of the video as well. So to make sure you guys can follow along, we've split them into categories with timestamps. So we'll start by talking about caries and how that can progress to pulpal and periapical diagnoses. And we'll follow that up by covering all the periodontal diagnoses and tooth surface loss. And at the end, we'll talk about some of the other diagnoses that don't really fit into a category. The first diagnosis we're going to be covering is caries. There's loads of different ways of diagnosing caries, but the main ones are visual, tactile, and radiographic. Caries can start as an active white spot lesion and these look smooth, frosty, opaque and non-cavitated and they're detected more easily when air dried with a 3-in-1 syringe. As the caries progresses they become roughened, chalky and micro-cavitated and now you can detect them by running a probe along the surface. There are no symptoms at this stage and if the plaque is removed the lesion can arrest and become a brown spot lesion with a hard shiny surface. <laughs> So caries progresses into dentin without much lateral spread, but once it reaches the enamel dentin junction, it can spread laterally along this junction and down the dentinal tubules towards the pulp. This is where the patient may start experiencing some symptoms of what we call reversible pulpitis. The standout symptoms are a localized sharp pain, which lasts a few seconds and comes on when the patient has something hot, cold or sweet. And it's called reversible because basically if you treat the caries by doing a filling, the pulp should return back to its normal healthy state and stop causing symptoms to the patient. If the caries isn't treated, it will approach the pulp and cause it to become chronically inflamed. At this stage, it's called symptomatic irreversible pulpitis, with symptoms of a spontaneous, dull and prolonged pain that lasts several minutes. It's irreversible because if we just remove the caries and do a filling, the pulp will remain inflamed and cause pain, and so there's a need for root canal treatment. Other than the presentation of pain, there's a few questions you can ask your patients to differentiate whether it's reversible or irreversible pulpitis. Does the pain keep you up at night, for example? If it does, then it's irreversible pulpitis. Do painkillers help? If they don't, again, it's irreversible pulpitis. Do cold drinks alleviate the pain? It tends to with irreversible pulpitis. Sometimes you might see a patient with a large carious lesion that's already reached the pulp, but they don't experience any pain with hot or cold stimuli. This is known as asymptomatic irreversible pulpitis. Now, as the infection advances, the pulp will start to die. This is called pulp necrosis, and at this stage, the patient may actually present with a history of pulpotic symptoms, which they no longer have. So while the pulp is dying, the bacteria will also travel to the periapical tissues and cause symptoms of apical periodontitis, or as some others call it, acute apical periodontitis. At this stage, they get a well-localized pain when biting, and this is because the periodontal ligament is inflamed and biting stimulates the pain and pressure sensitive fibers in the area. The bacteria in the necrotic pulp will also leach toxins through the apex, causing a chronic inflammatory response, which leads to bone resorption. Now, if enough bone resorption occurs, this will be seen in the radiograph as an apical radiolucency. Symptomatic apical periodontitis often presents with symptoms of irreversible pulpitis as well, because this is all a dynamic process. One disease leads to another, and some diseases also happen at the same time. So as the pulp is inflamed, a person might experience symptoms of irreversible pulpitis. And now that the PDL is also inflamed, they may also experience periapical symptoms. But if it's left untreated at this stage, the pulp might die and they might only experience periapical symptoms, for example. If the symptomatic apical periodontitis is left to progress, this may become an asymptomatic apical periodontitis, also known as chronic apical periodontitis. And this happens because of chronic inflammation and destruction of the periodontium. This would be visible on a radiograph, but as a much larger, well-defined radiolucency and can re-exacerbate to become symptomatic apical periodontitis again, or as others would call it, an acute exacerbation of chronic apical periodontitis. At any point from once the infection has gone through the apex, an acute apical abscess can form. This is a pus-filled swelling which can cause severe spontaneous pain and extreme tenderness to touch. There's lots of pain because the abscess is causing a lot of pressure in the area, and if the abscess is able to be drained, for example through a sinus tract in the gums, then the pressure is relieved and the patient will experience little or no pain. A draining abscess like this is called a chronic apical abscess. To find out which tooth is causing the abscess, you can put a GP point in the sinus and then take a radiograph. The GP will follow the tract and point to the infected tooth. The next diagnosis is one that is often missed out. If you carry a root canal treatment, there's a slight chance that the patient might come back to you soon after with severe pain, sometimes described as even worse than before, and maybe a swelling. This is known as a phoenix abscess and is mainly caused by inadequate cleaning of the root canals. You should always warn your patients of this before you start root canal treatment. 
You might also have come across a disease process called condensing osteitis. We're not going to go into too much detail on this one because it's a lot rarer, but it's a reaction to dental infection. But on the radiograph, it's radio opaque because instead of bone destruction, there's more bone deposition. It can happen when there's a low degree of virulence from the infection and the host's healthy immune system triggers a sclerotic reaction. So now we've covered all the pulpal diagnoses, which are reversible pulpitis, symptomatic irreversible pulpitis, asymptomatic irreversible pulpitis, pulpal necrosis, and the periapical diagnoses, which are symptomatic apical periodontitis, asymptomatic apical periodontitis, acute apical abscess, chronic apical abscess, and condensing osteitis. It's important to note that when you provide a diagnosis for a tooth, you have to give both a pulpal diagnosis and a periapical diagnosis. So for example, you might say pulp necrosis and symptomatic apical periodontitis of the upper left six. So we're gonna move on to the diagnosis of gum disease or periodontitis. You first need to take a periodontal screening for every patient that walks through your door. The screening tool used is called a basic periodontal examination. And if you're unsure of what that is, you can pause the video now and have a little look on your screen. Now that you've got a code for each sextant, the British Society of Periodontology have formed an in-depth sheet to follow, which we'll go through in this video. And keep in mind that this classification is also used internationally. A BPE score of zero indicates healthy gums, while one and two would indicate some level of gingivitis, depending on how much bleeding you estimate to have seen. So let's start by discussing a patient who scores zeros and ones on their BPE. If while you were carrying out your BPE, you saw less than 10% bleeding when probing, this indicates clinical gingival health. If you saw between 10 and 30% bleeding on probing, you'll diagnose them with localized gingivitis and finally if there were more than 30 percent bleeding on probing this would be a generalized gingivitis now if they also scored a code 2 anywhere you would supplement the gingival diagnosis with any plaque retentive factors or calculus which might have led to that score of 2 so for example localized gingivitis due to overhanging restorations on upper right 5 upper right 6. let's start with code 3s only no code 4s you start by taking radiographs in the sextants with scores of 3 to assess if there's any bone loss in those areas you will then do an initial periodontal therapy, which is just a combination of good supergingival scaling and oral hygiene instructions, and then wait 8 to 12 weeks for the inflammation to cool down. This will reduce any false pocketing, and if it was real pocketing, sometimes just good oral hygiene is enough to close the pocket. Once you have the patient back after 8 to 12 weeks, the guidelines say that you do a 6-point pocket chart in the involved sextants, but we think it's best if you just redo a BPE, and if they score a 3, then you carry out a 6-point pocket chart in the involved sextants. The 6-point pocket chart will record pocket depths at 6 sites on each tooth, bleeding on probing, mobility, recession, and vacations. So that was for a BP over 3, but if the first time you saw the patient that had a BP of 4, you skip the initial periodontal therapy and the 8-12 to 12 week wait, and you go straight into taking radiographs, doing a 4 mouth 6 point pocket chart, and forming your diagnosis. So now let's discuss forming your diagnosis. If they had scores of 3 initially, but after the initial therapy had no pockets deeper than 4mm and no radiographic evidence of bone loss, you can diagnose them using the simpler diagnosis system of BPEs of 0, 1, and 2. If, however, you find that they have pockets deeper or equal to 4mm or have bone loss or both, then you proceed to diagnose them using the code 4 pathway. And if your patient had BPO4 from the beginning, you also diagnose them with this pathway. In this pathway, if you notice that there's a pattern on just the molars and the incisors, this is diagnosed as periodontitis molar incisor pattern, followed by the staging, grading, stability, and risk factors, which we'll talk about in just a bit. If you find that there is less than 30% of teeth with pocket depths of less than or equal to 4 millimeters and teeth with radiographic evidence of bone loss, this is diagnosed as localized periodontitis. More than 30% will be generalized periodontitis. To classify the stage and grade, you need the radiograph that you took on that first appointment. Staging refers to the severity of the disease and is calculated using the worst site of bone loss, while grading refers to the rate at which the disease is progressing, and this is calculated using the percent of bone loss and the patient's age. You don't actually need to whip out a calculator on clinic, by the way. It's really simple maths. If the patient is 30 and you have more than 30% bone loss, then the ratio is more than 1, and that's grade C. And if it's that same 30 year old who had a bone loss of 15%, that would be grade A. And if it's anything in between, then it would be grade B. Stability also needs to be assessed and it would be tedious for me to just recite to you what you can already read But it's important to note that anything which has a pocket depth of more than or equal to five millimeters Will always be classified as unstable Which is something I've heard so many of my clinicians saying it's a flaw in the classification Because if someone went from having eight millimeter pockets down to five millimeter pockets That's an amazing improvement, right? Even if it stays at five millimeters for the rest of their life they will classify that as unstable. Risk factors include things like smoking and diabetes, but you can pause here for a full list taken from the BSB guidelines. 
Finally, combine everything you've found so far and there you go, you've got your periodontal diagnosis. One last diagnosis involving period that we want to mention is a lateral periodontal abscess. This is similar to a periabical abscess, which we discussed before, but the difference is that it's on the side of the tooth instead of the apex, and the pulp is usually vital because pulp necrosis is not the cause here. A periodontal abscess is actually caused by the bacteria inside of a deep periodontal pocket. A pus-filled abscess may form when the immune system responds to the bacteria and attempts to isolate the infection from spreading. Usually, the pus will drain naturally through their pocket, but if there's something in there blocking the drainage like calculus or trapped food, then the abscess can grow. The next thing we're gonna be discussing is tooth surface loss. Tooth surface loss is the loss of hard tissue caused by factors other than caries. The four types we're going to be discussing are erosion, attrition, abrasion, and abfraction. The first one is erosion, which is tooth surface loss caused by a chemical process like an acid attack not involving bacteria. And there are both intrinsic and extrinsic sources of acid. Intrinsic sources are things like acid reflux or vomiting, and these patients usually present with palatal tooth surface loss on the upper teeth. With these patients, you don't see much tooth surface loss on the lower molars or the incisors because as they have acid reflux or they throw up, their tongue goes over and protects those teeth. Now, extrinsic sources are mainly diet related, like fizzy drinks and juices. These patients mostly present with tooth surface loss on the labial surfaces of incisors and the occlusal surfaces of molars. In both types, you might see bowl-like wear facets, sometimes called a ring of enamel. And this happens because the dentine wears away at a faster rate than the enamel. There's also environmental sources of acid, like working in environments such as a battery factory. This is a lot rarer now because of stricter health and safety regulations. There are plenty of other causes for tooth surface loss as well, so pause here for the full list that we've come up with. Once you've identified the cause, there's a couple things to look out for when assessing patients as to whether the tooth surface loss is ongoing or arrested. If there's staining on the teeth, this suggests that it's been arrested because if it was active, the stain layer would have worn out. A sign of inactive tooth surface loss is when they used to experience hypersensitivity, but now they don't. And when you look into their mouth, you can see signs of tooth surface loss like the ones that we talked about before. The sensitivity here has stopped because the cause of tooth surface loss has stopped as well and has allowed time for tertiary dentine to form. The next type of tooth surface loss is attrition, which is tooth wear caused by tooth to tooth contact, usually associated with grinding and parafunctional activities. Patients usually present with smooth facets, which are flat and match the opposing teeth, and you usually see it happening at the same time as erosion. That's because erosion will demineralize the hard tissues, which weakens it, and then grinding wears it away. If the tooth surface loss by attrition is extensive and rapid, you should expect to see a reduction in the OVD, so the patient would look overclosed, or like a grandma with no teeth. You wouldn't see this if the tooth wear was gradual, because dental alveolar compensation will maintain their OVD. Dental alveolar compensation is the process where alveolar bone remodels and elongates to compensate for the loss of vertical dimension. For example, you can see the difference in these photos. You've got no dental alveolar compensation on the left and the gingival margins of all the lower incisors are in one straight line. In the photo on the right, you can see the lower incisors are at a higher level compared to the canines due to the dental alveolar compensation. You can also see an increased width of the attached gingiva. The next type of tooth surface loss is abrasion and it's tooth wear caused by tooth to non-tooth contact. So for example, hard tooth brushing with charcoal activated toothpaste or habits like pen biting. Depending on the habit, the patient will often present differently. So for example, if a patient is right-handed and constantly over brushing the left side of their mouth, you would see that the tooth were on the buccal cervical margins of the upper left teeth. Whereas with pen biting, you will see chipped incisal edges. The last type of tooth surface loss is known as abfraction. This is defined as a fracture on the cervical margin, which is caused by flexures upon occlusal loading. This is how it looks. Abfraction is sometimes missed out from books which talk about tooth surface loss because it's not believed to be as relevant or necessarily true. Now we're gonna talk about some of the diagnoses that didn't really fit into a category, but are still essential for you to know. First one on the list is dentine hypersensitivity, and it occurs when there's exposed dentine and can be caused by things like the tooth surface loss that we discussed, trauma, caries, gingival recession, and maybe even an overetched composite filling. The patient would present with a localized sharp pain to hot, cold, and or sweets. The pain usually only lasts a few seconds and goes away after the stimulus is removed. This pain can be replicated if you blow air from your three in one syringe at the tooth, but be careful when you do this and make sure you warn the patient before you do because it can really surprise them. Another diagnosis you should be aware of is called cracked tooth syndrome. This is defined as an incomplete fracture in a vital posterior tooth. Your patient might present with a sharp localized pain, which might be made worse by releasing after biting down. The best way to test this is with something called a tooth sleuth. And there are two places that you should test. 
the fissures and each of the individual cusps. The way you use it is by placing the pointy end on the tooth in question and asking the patient to bite and hold. Then release and ask them at what point it hurt them. Second to last on the list is pericoronitis, which is the inflammation of the operculum, which is the soft tissue surrounding an impacted tooth. You'll pretty much only see this on the eights, but it can technically happen to any other partially erupted tooth. The patients are usually between 17 and 24 as well, since this is the time when the wisdom teeth are erupting, and they present with localized pain, swelling, and they might have difficulty opening their mouth. It's not uncommon to also see lymphadenopathy, bad breath or pus, Sometimes patients even come in with very large swellings and you'll need to know when it's an emergency or not. The signs that would make you consider referring them straight to A&E are difficulty breathing, difficulty swallowing, or difficulty sticking their tongue out. Swellings like this in the floor of their mouth can be especially dangerous since they can block the airways, known as Ludwig's angina, and be a cause of death. The last diagnosis we think you should know is called alveolar osteitis. This is a fancy way of saying a dry socket. It's the inflammation of the exposed alveolar bone in the socket when a blood clot fails after an extraction. The patient would usually come back two to five days post extraction complaining that they have a severe throbbing pain which is worse now than it was before they had the tooth removed. They also tell you that they have bad breath and taste and that's because food would have been packing into the socket. Blood clots fail by dislodging or never forming in the first place. It can dislodge by the change in air pressure from smoking or using a straw or even mouth washing too aggressively within 24 hours of the extraction. Other risk factors are difficult extractions, a previous dry socket, diabetes, anticoagulants, or even if someone suffers from blood clotting disorders. If you made it this far in the video, thank you so much for watching. We hope you found that video helpful. If you did, we'd really appreciate it if you guys gave us a like and subscribe. You might also enjoy some of the other videos that we have on the channel, so feel free to check out some of the suggestions we have here. Also, if your uni teaches you a different way of diagnosing, then put that in the comments and we can compare and have a conversation about it. See you guys in the next video. Peace.